all the years that I've coached and in 31 deep and counting, I've never had a season like that one. It was the most magical season that you could ever experience as a player, or as a coach. This is the Sean Miller Podcast, presented by Deer Park Roofing. Now, here's your hosts, Paul Fritchner and Adam Baum, with the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Sean Miller. Welcome in to the Sean Miller Podcast. As always, we like to thank our presenting sponsor, Deer Park Roofing, as well as the official payroll sponsor of the Sean Miller Podcast, Payroll Partners, and our friends at TGE Solar. Paul Fritchner alongside Adam Baum, the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Sean Miller, and to my right, a very special guest today, <laughs> Justin Dolman, a member of the class of 2020 of the Hall of Fame here at Xavier. You started all but nine games in your career. You played one year under Thad Mata and three years for Sean Miller. Yes, sir. Justin, it's great to see. It's great to have you back here at Cintas. I know you're a season ticket holder, so you get Mm -hmm. a chance to come back uh, to see some games throughout the year. I've seen you a few times this year. Uh, But just for the fans that don't know uh, what you've been up to since the last time they maybe saw you in a Xavier jersey, you had a fantastic professional career uh, in Europe. So just for people that haven't heard from you since then, how's life been for you? You have your family (laughs) here and, uh, and, and how was your professional career? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Um, and it's it's great to get back into the CentOS Center. Yeah, we do have season tickets. Uh, we try to make it to quite a few games um, with the kids' schedule, with their soccer and basketball and, and all their other activities. We, we try to make it down. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But um, the last couple of years, um, I ended up retiring from basketball. So before that, uh, went played three years in France professionally and then transitioned to, to Spain. Um, played eight years in Spain, short stint in Turkey and Montenegro after that. So it was a uh, long and, and prosperous career. Very fortunate to be able to play that long. Um, had a lot of success, success along the way. Um, just tried to, to get into a league and then climb 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 the ladder from there and ended up doing, doing very well in Spain. Yeah. I mean, Sean, looking back at recruiting Justin mm-hmm. I mean you so you were an assistant at the time and a local guy Justin went to Ryle which is right across the river yep. in, in mm-hmm. northern Kentucky but what do you remember about recruiting Justin all the way back then you know I, I think about that recruitment often because uh and Justin will I think will share my my comments and thoughts about it he wasn't the most highly recruited player uh, matter of fact I don't think he was recruited nearly the level that he should have been recruited coming out of high school. Uh, Maybe it was location, timing. You know, if you look at him today, he's physically fit and he's a thin, (laughs) you know, world-class type of athlete. If you remember him as a junior in high school, he was skinny beyond skinny. Oh, you're absolutely right. (laughs) I'm going to say you were about 6'7", maybe not even 6'8", at the time. Mm -hmm. And God, you might have been 180 pounds, maybe. I think when I graduated, I was 175, and that was probably ring and wet. Right. So um, think about think about that. So you're gonna you're going to bet on somebody who's six seven, 170, 175 pounds, like you had mentioned from right across the river there in, in Ryle. But I, I got to tell you, Mike Price, who Justin mm-hmm. played for uh, in his AAU days, his travel team days. Coach Price is you know legendary high school coach here in Cincinnati. But I don't know. There's too many people that have given more of their life to young people than him. He was one of Justin's biggest fans. And I was an assistant coach, and I talked to to Coach Price a lot, and he would always tell me, I'm telling you, this guy Justin Dolman is going to be good. He can pass, Sean. He he has a way of seeing the court for somebody his size. And he's thin now, but as he gets stronger, he's going to be a really good college player. So I would always go into watching Justin through Mike Price's comments with because of the respect. And as I got a chance to know Justin and his family and watched him play, uh, I, I fell in love with the way he played. And I really felt like the way the game was changing, that it was changing in a way that would really benefit him when his time came in college. That's when you weren't playing two big men all the time now. A lot of teams still were, but there was like this transition into playing maybe four out one end. Mm-hmm. And he would have been the ultimate <laughs> You know, we call it right now the trigger position where you're a big guy, but on offense, you're really a guard. And that's really what he was. His ability to pass, play the team game, be a smart player and play really with physicality and toughness, even though he wasn't the biggest, strongest guy out there, that became his calling card. And, and look, people forget 
he said he was 170, 175 pounds. You think this story was like development? Like, oh, well, in year one, he didn't do anything? Just the opposite. He was a fixture on our first team where we went all the way to the Elite Eight and almost beat Duke in that regional final. And he started, he played, and he was a fixture on the team as a freshman. So you think about somebody that I think chose us over Western Kentucky. Yeah, there was a couple. It, I can't remember exactly, but it was Western Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky. I think there was some other bigger names in the area, yeah. but it wasn't like they weren't recruiting me hard, like you said. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, Notre Dame was in the mix, um, getting letters from Michigan State, but it wasn't, it they wasn't, it, it wasn't anything yeah. serious. It wasn't the yeah. level of commitment that, that you and Thad had right. and the passion. I think on the recruiting process, the, the personas that you guys have, the personalities, we really related. And when I was coming down to making that final decision with the Xavier program, it was one, I wanted to be close, close to home so my parents could, could see me play. But then also to your point, to come in and have an impact. I didn't know right. what that would be. Right. Like there was, I mean, the envelope was was big there, but I wanted to come in and, and, and earn minutes. The envelope was big. Let's rephrase that. Yeah, we can. <laughs> that could be, that connotation could go a lot of different ways now, all right? Uh, okay, we can, we can, yeah. Could you explain what you mean by the envelope being big? Because that didn't sound right. <laughs> no, so <laughs> that's fair, fair enough. <laughs> what I meant by that was, that I had the opportunity to come in and play, meaning right. there was a lot of opportunity yep. there because of the personnel that you had leaving at the time, right? Yeah. So I think D West was was transitioning yeah. out a couple other players, and there was a lot of uh, power forward positions to fill, mm -hmm. and somebody with my skill set that could stretch the floor because, like you said, the the um, the game was changing. Yeah. But, and that's what I meant by the yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I'm glad we got that. I'm glad we got that straight on a lot of levels there. Yes. Uh, but. Yes. So I said that I think about you often. I did when I was at Arizona. One, because I recruited you. I, I'll, I'll take full responsibility. Like mm -hmm. It was my passion. I pushed it. And I really, it didn't take that a lot to get on because I think he saw what I saw. But I was like, I really felt like regardless of what he's rated, regardless of who's recruiting him, this is what I believe and see. That's not as easy to do. And when you're an assistant coach, when you're part of a program, you know, a lot of times it's you want to recruit the highest ranking, right? We want to, I want to, I want to, it has to be okay for me to recruit him. Who else is recruiting? What is he ranked? And in mm -hmm. that case, he was 0 for 2. He wasn't ranked high and he had a lot of people that, man, why aren't they recruiting him? Well, it got to a point where when I would go watch him play in the spring and summer, I would actually cheer against him. I wanted him to miss. <laughs> I, I didn't want him to play well because what would have been the worst case scenario is, all of a sudden, that school that, oh, I don't know, you know, the Big Ten school or the name in your mind that you wondered if they'll ever recruit you, if that happens, that makes it a lot more difficult to get him. So I was hoping he would miss shots. I was hoping he would fall <laughs> under the radar. And uh, that shows you how, how strongly I believed in him. And then to coach him and watch it work out as a freshman, and then I became the head coach, and he became a real fixture towards – the growth of me as a head coach in the building blocks of taking where we were as a program to an even higher level. Uh, the time that he was here, he blazed the trail as big as, as any individual player that, that we had. You made the tournament three out of your four years mm -hmm. here at Xavier, and you were part of that run that we talked about, the, the run that everybody knows if you're a Xavier fan to go to the Elite Eight in that year and just come up a little bit short of the final mm -hmm. four, but still to put everything together at the end of the season after so much had gone against you in that year, being mm -hmm. your freshman year. What do you remember about that? Maybe the coaching staff and what the message was to then band together, win those four games in four days and go on the run in the tournament? Well, I think the coaches set set the precedent from the very beginning of just staying together. And then we had those three three key seniors with Anthony Miles, Romain Sato, and Lionel Chalmers. And they they really were great mentors and leaders in the locker room. Um, Lionel being more vocal and Romain leading by example, and then and then Anthony Miles being a big big man and trying to um, enforce the physicality on the inside. So that was very important to just kind of follow in their footsteps. But in order to for us to be successful, we had to make a change. I mean, we were, I think, 10 and 9 um, before yep. we, we started to trampoline into what we, our potential could be. I think at the beginning of the season, and I might be wrong, but we had guys on different agendas. They were thinking about, you know, maybe the next level or what that was going to pan out to be. 
And once Lionel hit that shot and we just trampolined past UC, it was like for some odd reason, our locker room chemistry just all came together. And then we were able to propel, um, just went on a, a great wrench, one win streak with a run and then ended up beating St. Joe's in, in Dayton, which was um, an unbelievable experience because we, we beat the brakes off of them. And it was it was tremendous. And then that propelled us into the tournament and everybody knows the rest is history. Yeah. All the years that I've coached and I'm 31 deep and counting, I've never had a season like that one. It was the most magical season that you could ever experience as a player, as mm -hmm. a coach, because I don't think people really truly understand what 10 and nine feels like when you're getting ready to play UC mm -hmm. in the Crosstown shootout. Bob Huggins is the head coach and they're really good. You're looking at losing potentially a home game against them mm -hmm. and going 10 and 10. And we were in the Atlantic 10, so it wasn't as if you had an opportunity to get And they were a very large, physical very, team. Very physical. That win, but the magic of different people embracing roles, those three seniors, uh, I thought they did as good of a job both leading by example and then playing to win, you mm -hmm. know, really caring about something that was bigger than just their own careers and what they were doing. Taking guys like you who just got to college and giving you confidence and bringing you along to mm -hmm. make you a part of things. But it was magical because, remember this, we won all these games in a row. It felt like we were never going to lose. And I don't know if you remember this. We were playing a game right around this time, late February, might even have been early March. Could have been one of the final home games of the year. And Duquesne came in here mm -hmm. and beat us. So it's like people remember you were 10-9, and nine, Lionel made the shot against UC, and you magically went to the Elite Eight. Well, we won a lot of games, maybe 11 in a row, and we lost to Duquesne, who was not good at mm -hmm. home as part of that. So when we went to Dayton, we didn't even get a bye in the Atlantic 10. We played on that first night. Yep. I think we played St. Bonaventure, if I'm... Um, Sounds right. I'm going. And... After St. Bonaventure, again, I think where we were seated, we played St. Joe's maybe in that second game. I think it was the second game, yeah. Third at George Washington. GW, then, then St. Joe's, okay. and then Dayton. So George Washington, people that probably have forgotten, they were great. Well, they, they, were, they smacked us early. Right. <laughs> they were an at-large team, I believe, in the tournament. Uh, mm -hmm. They had a great roster. Carl Hobbs was their coach. Mm -hmm. By the way, this 8-10 tournament happened to be at UD Arena. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> so as the story unfolds, you win one game, St. Bonaventure. Mm -hmm. You play George Washington. They're going to mm -hmm. be one of, one of the Atlantic 10's best teams. Mm -hmm. You win. And guess what? You're now playing a team that had not lost 31 and 0 or 30 and 0 at the time. Jameer Nelson, they were number one in America. Uh, very few teams had ever gone wire to wire without losing before the mm -hmm. tournament. And uh, we not only beat them, I mean, we named the score. It, it felt like we won by 30. Yeah, it was yeah. it was that big. I mean, yeah. at one point it, we did break them open. But to, to talk about St. Joe's, when they came to our place earlier on in the season, I think Delonte West went 12 for 12. He did, I mean, yeah. it was an unbelievable game. Yeah. It was. They were a great team. And then, Phil Martelli was the coach. The yep. Atlantic 10 was super good, really good, mm -hmm. good. Uh, I mean, those were some amazing days. But I'll tell you, uh, Justin, one of the differences between being an assistant and head coach, probably mid-second half, St. Joe's, and I think we were up 25 or something, and they probably went on like a 6-0 run, you know. And coach Mata looked and said, you think we you think we can hold on? Like, do I need to you know, <laughs> sub, whatever? I, I looked up and said, we're up by 30. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could play four on five. I'm telling you, we're going to win. We're right. going to get we'll there. Maybe, right. We may win by two points, but we're winning by 30. Relax. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, that's me right now. I'm like, shut up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but we beat them, right? So now they're 30, you know, now they're 30 and one. So you beat St. Bonaventure. You beat George Washington. You just beat the team 30, you know, and I'll never forget Mike Babinski was our athletic director mm -hmm. after the game. And we were just, Filled with joy. It was amazing, right? And I looked at Mike and said, we're in the tournament now, right? I mean, he goes, you got to win tomorrow. And we had to play Dayton on their home court to win the tournament. And by the way, Dayton was really good. I think they finished first yeah. or second that year. Yeah. So if you think about what I just described to you, right? You're 10 and 9. You win. You win 10 or 11 in a row. You lose to Duquesne at home. You don't even get a bye. You go to UD Arena. You win three games in three days. 
The third game is the number one team in America, who's 30 and 0. No team had ever, I don't believe at that point, had won in their conference tournament four games in a row in four days. So Correct. we had that. Correct. And we're playing Dayton on their home court at in Dayton. front of a fever pitched UD crowd. And we beat the shit out of them. We did. Yeah, we did. We did. I mean, there was, was no amazing. better feeling. I we mean, cut their nets down. Uh, it was just, I looked at you guys. And then again, when you think about that, that think about how you feel as a coach, how you feel as a player, a young player. It's like, mm-hmm. this is amazing. This is amazing. Can you believe we just did this? I mean, and, I, mean and I was, by a, de- way, we I was a deer in the headlights. Yeah. I, I, right. I didn't even know. I couldn't even put my, my emotions into words right. at that moment. It was just, it was like you said, magical to do. Go through all those hurdles that you just described and to do that in at UD Arena. Like, yeah. All the games you've played, because you had such a long pro career, in all the moments, I would imagine that winning that game and going to the tournament as the automatic berth, if it just stopped there, that, that would have to be one of your great moments as a player. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it, it would be one of my most fulfilling moments as a coach. Uh, I wasn't the head coach, but... We had a party uh, later that night. Uh, I'll tell you, I just I could barely remember anything. It was just it was just it was just like we did it. Now, now we go to the tournament, and I think the seed we got was like a ten seed. That should tell you everything mm-hmm. you need to know. When you win seventeen of eighteen, beat St. Joe's, and you get a ten seed, we weren't in the tournament unless we beat Dayton. But look, we played Mississippi State. Mm-hmm. No, we played uh, Louisville in the first game. I think Louisville. Hold on. No. I believe, I believe it, was it was Louisville. Yeah. Yep. At that at that point, I think Coach Patino had never lost a first round game. Okay. At Francisco Garcia. They were about a year away from being a great team, but they were really good. Mm-hmm. We beat them. I think convincingly. Ten points. And then we played Mississippi State, who would have been a two seed. Mm-hmm. We beat them convincingly. Fifteen. And then we're in the Sweet Sixteen. We play Texas, Texas. in uh, in the dome in Atlanta. Yep. And we win that game. And let's go to Duke. What do you remember about that game? Elite Eight, Atlanta, I remember, Georgia. I remember a lot, of, a lot about that game. Yeah, I mean. Some well, of the players in the game would it be names that people would know. J.J. J. J. Reddick, Reddick Luau Dang, Chris Duhon. Sheldon, Sheldon Williams. Williams. Yep. Uh, Ewing, I can't remember his first name. He was a point guard. Daniel Ewing. Daniel Very Ewing, player, he was yep. there. I mean, they, they had a loaded roster. Yep. And could really fill it up. And, I mean, we, we gave it to them. We did everything we could. And unfortunately, like Anthony Miles got in foul trouble yeah. and he was having a heck of a game. Yeah. And we, I think the first half we were able to hold Luau Dang to maybe two points. Mm. And then he really opened it up in, in, in the second half. But I mean, we were, we were in it and just to be a freshman on that stage, I think it was what, 48,000 people in the yeah, Georgia Dome. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, the way they put together that court and everything else, I mean, to run out there and you're like, holy cow, like I'm in a football <laughs> arena. No, you were at, you were at Ryle High School. Yeah, like, uh, come on. Know, think about that. You were at Ryle High School 12 months earlier, yeah. you know? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Not, not yeah. even. Yeah, was, and that's why, again, when you think about, I think one of the remarkable parts about your career here is where you were as a senior and junior in high school, who recruited you? us believing in you and it mm-hmm. translating into immediate success on a team. Think about what we're talking about. We entered that last four minute segment, I think maybe up one, down one, and we ended up losing a heartbreaker to Duke. Mm-hmm. They went on to the final four and our season ended. But people here used to recall, call that the run. Mm-hmm. But of all the teams and moments that I've been a part of, good and bad, that season probably has more lessons that you can talk to a young person or a team oh, absolutely. than any season I've been a part of because hope is everything and you guys stuck together and magic happened and remarkable. Really, I think it's one of the great, great seasons that's ever, ever been established here. And uh, I think it's something we all continue to talk to our team about. We use examples constantly about that year with some of our own players, even this year. That's great to hear. I mean, like you said, the lessons there with our senior leadership, I think it started uh, with the coaching staff, which trickled down to them. And then um, the seniors being able to show like Justin Cage and myself, who are, you know, these yeah. fresh little little freshmen that really don't know anything. And we're just we're just trying to make it and to have that leadership in the locker room. And for whatever reason, we just gelled at, at that perfect moment and we're able to continue that momentum. So we're going to I'm going to we're going to tell the story. Mm-hmm. All right. It's been a long time since this story was told. I'm going to bring it back. 
So Coach Mata leaves. <clears throat> I'm fortunate to be named the new head coach. Certainly, I knew all of you guys. You knew me as an assistant coach. In your case, you knew me because I recruited you in addition to being your assistant coach. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to continue this journey on the heels of an Elite Eight with a brand new team. And we had a good young recruiting class, which became, again, a fixture of the future. Stanley Burrell, Josh Duncan, right? Those mm -hmm. two in particular. So when we recruited Josh Duncan, Josh had a thing that he just was, it was almost, it was spiritual. It was at that level where he, he wanted to have a certain number, jersey number. And he was a junior, senior at Moeller High School. And, you know, we recruited him very hard. We were thrilled to get him. I know he's a friend. He was mm -hmm. a great teammate. He's an awesome guy. Yeah, great guy. We ended up playing yeah. each other, against yeah. each other overseas. It, it was, yeah, yeah, over in Europe. Yeah. When he was in France. But, yeah, great dude. Yeah, and became a great player for us. Uh, so he was coming in. We're super excited about it. And, you know, in my case, you know, Coach Mata was the head coach. I'm the assistant coach. And I wanted to make sure he was still coming to Xavier. And he was, and we were all set. But Coach Mata had a deal with him, and that deal was, hey, if the number means that much to you, you got it. Mm -hmm. So that's really all he wanted. He, you know, he wanted that number, and fine, and great, I'm coming to Xavier. Well, when he left, you know, that question popped up again. Hey, Coach, I just want to make sure that, <laughs> that uh, you know, the number still stood. And I said, you know, you refresh me on what, what you're talking about, you know. He, well, no, Coach Mata told me that I could have – certain jersey number that number would have been 15 15 so i thought about it a second and i said i think that's justin dolman's number <laughs> and he kind of looked at me and said it is i said well i'll work it out <laughs> <laughs> so this is what i did thought about it i remember that day think about it you still i mean that says a lot right i mean oh, yeah. you're an old man now so i remember up, that day you, you're like Hey, Justin, can you come up to the office? I'm like, <laughs> right here. Yeah. Yep. Well, that, that's weird. Like, yeah. this, what, what's happening? Shut the door, walked in. Tell yeah. me if I went like this. You're like, hey, hey, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> then go ahead. I got, I'm cut right to it, Justin. Coach Mata had told Justin and, and or uh, Josh Duncan that he's going to get a certain number. And, and Josh said, all he could get, get is a yes, no. The answer was yes. And uh, that number happens to be 15. And before you say anything, Justin, you have three choices. <laughs> no problem, coach. There's another number I'll be more than happy to. I might have even really pushed you that way. Oh, you, you There's were, another you were number that could be bit. good or work. I'm going to be a sophomore that's going to take on a new persona. <laughs> Not a big deal to me. Sure. Mm -hmm. Love to have Josh as a teammate. You could say that. Yes. Mm -hmm. You could say I need a little bit more time to think about it. I, I certainly respect that. You don't have to give me an answer yes, no, right now. Um, take all the time in the world. <laughs> or uh, absolutely not. But you reserve the right as a player who's already been here, who wore that jersey number, uh, because I'm assuming no one cleared this with you. Is that right? You said, no. I said, okay. I said, do you, do you have an answer? He said, yeah, number three, absolutely no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll take the latter. Not freaking happening. <laughs> I remember thinking like, damn, it's harder to be a head coach. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was early, yeah. So we'll just stop right there. Josh, being the great person he is, ended up taking, I think, number one, wore mm -hmm. his whole career, made mm -hmm. it a great number. You kept 15, but I'm there, I'm there for guy. I think I told my wife like, boy. You're not going to believe this mess I had today. And again, back then it was like, man, this is a major mess. It's really not. But look, when you're dealing with these guys on things like their number, it, jersey number means a lot to them. And uh, when they feel like they're double crossed, sometimes you can really lose great trust. So uh, I'll never forget it. Three choices. You could say yes. And I pointed them that direction. You could say more time. Threes, no. What, what, do, you, what do you think, Justin? Three. No, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just from what we just talked about, the, our season that we had just had, I, I become really attached to that number and just the adversity that we went through. And I was like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to keep it.
The Sean Miller Podcast is proud to partner with Deer Park Roofing, a company that's provided elite service for homes and businesses since 1996 and leads the industry in professionalism, quality, and responsiveness. Whether your needs are residential or commercial, like the outstanding work on the Cintas Center, the home of Xavier Basketball, Deer Park can handle any job and ensure it's done right. Deer Park's motto is protect what's important, and what's important to you is important to Deer Park Roofing. Visit DeerParkRoofing.com. The Sean Miller Podcast is proud to partner with Payroll Partners, where you're not just a number. That means providing a best-in-class HR and payroll experience that was built on award-winning technology and live support customer service with a dedicated payroll specialist who's just a phone call away. You shouldn't have to choose between technology and customer service. At Payroll Partners, you get both. Payroll Partners is locally owned and operated by a proud Xavier alum. Visit PayrollPartners.net. That's PayrollPartners.net. Welcome back to the Sean Miller podcast. Really enjoying having Justin Dolman here uh, to join us. But I'm curious, like you, you leave Xavier and mm-hmm. you go on to have this illustrious overseas career. And I think, Sean, did you you had sort of an interaction overseas when you were at Arizona with your your paths kind of crossed with Justin's overseas? For sure. You know, I was following his career from a distance, and I think he, he would admit it. When you go to Europe or you're playing international, you, there's a tendency you can become disconnected to some degree. Mm-hmm. It's not easy to communicate with the time change. He actually visited me in Tucson mm-hmm. uh, yep. one summer. I'm trying to think what summer it was. It was a long, long time ago. It was the second or third summer. Yeah. Yeah. That I was there. I can't, I can't oh, remember well, exactly, but oh, yeah, well, I came out to see you. Just yep. say, hey, see, see how things were going. So, um, but anyway, we took a foreign trip at Arizona. We took it to Spain and uh, we went to a couple cities. Barcelona is where it ended. And uh, we went to Valencia first. And, you know, I had a recollection that Romain Sato played for Valencia. I knew that. But we went to the facility, uh, you know, where the pro team plays. And they have a mural of Romain. Mm -hmm. Like at Valencia, you know, he's... He is, I mean, world class. He's an all star. He's a Euro mm-hmm. League champion. He's just, he's revered. And then I quickly found out as I'm looking at the history on these walls and reading about it. And then I ran into either the general manager that was there or one of your coaches or somebody that was familiar with the organization. They helped us establish practice and everything. And he said, you know, Justin, I said, Justin Dolman play, played here too. He said, yeah. I said, I, I coached. Justin Dolman and Romain Sato. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we talked for a long time and he was saying how wonderful that time was. I knew you guys had won a championship, but I just asked you about this off air. So Romain Sato and Justin Dolman, 10 years later, after you guys did mm-hmm. what we did here at Xavier, you're on the same team in Valencia and you won the Euro Cup championship. We did, we did. Which is incredible if you think about that. So just... Valencia had been struggling in the years prior, and then I and Romain came to that team. And a lot like a situation here at Xavier, right? We we had different pieces doing their own own agendas, and we kind of just gelled as a team. And that first year, I ended up being there for two years, and Romain played multiple years later after that, after I had left and went to a different team. But in that first year, we came together and we started climbing the rankings. We started winning a bunch, bunch of games in Euro Cup and in the domestic league in Liga Endesa. And we finished, I think, fourth in the league that year, where in previous years they had been not even in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. And then in our second year, I mean, we had a really good group of uh, guys that were really bought into their roles, which, as you know, can be very difficult at, at like, a professional level with, yeah. I mean, guys trying to feed their families and going for points and everything else like that. But guys were really bought in. And in that second year, we I think we ended up finishing second in the regular season, ended up winning the Euro Cup championship. Mm-hmm. And in, in the finals, we just we destroyed teams just because of how gelled we were. But it was really cool because 10 years later, after playing together at Xavier, we were able to accomplish winning a championship mm-hmm. in, at the professional world. And um, it was it was just a magical feeling as well. Just just, you know, being over in Europe and then you're, you're going through the city of Valencia and you're you're in this giant parade where 20 30,000 people yeah. are in the streets. It was it was pretty unique. It was awesome for me to go over there and you know losing track I and mean, you're talking about 10 to 15 year window of time and you're like it's Romain Sato on yeah. the wall and yeah. Dolman played with him and oh my god, you know, but yeah, and Romain, what a player. You know, he didn't have an NBA career, but I know in Europe when I mentioned Romain's name, 
Everybody Yours knew. as well, but uh, Romain in particular, he is like the ultimate champion. Yeah, he had a more distinguished uh, European career just because he, he ended up winning, I think, a EuroLeague championship as well with Pantheonakos, and that yep. was early in his career. And from then on, like he was just he was a pinnacle. And in Valencia, because like you said, he was revered, and he, his physicality on the court was yeah. like no uh, no one else. Justin, of all the players that I've coached, I don't know if. if I've coached a kinder, more polite, humble. respectful, humble. I, I could keep going on yeah. and on and on as a person than Romain Sato. Mm -hmm. Like, if you don't love him, there's actually something wrong with you. Yes. You know, he is the most lovable, likable, gentleman, kind person, spiritual person that I was ever around. I mean, he was the same every day. Mm -hmm. But when he stepped onto the court, I mean, he was a savage. I mean, he was the ultimate competitor. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had a a smart temper. You know, like mm -hmm. some guys have that temper that they foul on purpose or, oh, you're losing your mind. No, not When him. he would get angry inside, he would go to a level that you're like, his, you said it, physicality, ability to rebound and then shoot the ball and his size and his toughness, his ability defensively to lock people up at different sizes. I mean, in that year that we talked about, the run, mm -hmm. the different players that he could guard in one game, it was amazing. But as soon as the game ended, I mean, he would hate to lose, but he was Romain, Mr. Kind, so... Yeah, he loved life. Uh, but as soon as the games began, his ability to compete and be a warrior was just amazing. And usually when you're that competitive on the court... Not that you're not a gentleman, but, you know, you show it some of that off mm -hmm. the court. Not him. It was just... And uh, being his teammate, am I, do I hit that right? Oh, you describing hit, it? hit the nail right on the head. I mean, on the court, he has like this alter, alternate ego that that he just goes to. And yeah. he's that physicality and competitiveness. And short story on him, the first time that I ever met him, I came to a practice just to watch you guys. Mm. And, you know, you called him over and you're like, hey, Romain, like, this is Justin, this, that, and the other thing. And you're like, oh, go, go hit your head on the backboard. And he would just... Walk over there, just yeah. jumped up, tapped <laughs> it, crazy. Yeah. and he's so <laughs> humble. But and then you watch him in practice, and he's this super intense, like going to get get up into you and 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 lock you up, per, person. And it was it was great to be a teammate at Xavier, and then also later in the professional career. And I I learned a lot from him. Yeah, we just uh, me and Paul did a podcast this past weekend, and I told my favorite Romaine story, which was I was the beat writer at the Enquirer covering the team. Romaine came back in town for a practice, brought his whole family, and I was sitting in the media room writing a story. I thought they had left. Romaine sent one of his daughters back in to give me a Christmas card. It was oh. right around. And I was like, that's such a perfect, that's yeah. the epitome it tells of, you the guy of Romaine. He's, yeah. he, he's really amazing. We're going to have him on the podcast. Okay. Uh, we, he hasn't done it yet. Um, but, yeah, he's he's uh, he's a favorite you know, of, of Xavier, he should be. He's a favorite teammate. He just, he's a guy you love to coach. You know? Well, he's a favorite in Valencia, and they have this this trophy there for uh, Cultura del Enfuerzo, which is like this, this like spirit of of the team. It's like you're, you're, he just embodied everything that they wanted in a, in, yeah. a, in a teammate. And like he fit that persona perfectly. I would echo that same deal here. Yeah. No, you could, you could say the same thing. Yep. So there's a dish in Valencia uh, the way I would describe it is it's not Italian, obviously, because it's Spain. I get that. Uh, but it's if you said it, it's like... Uh, Paella? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell me about that. I, they were raving about it. I tried it. And my, the one that I had, it was like purple. B I, was it a rose negro? It was black? So yeah, it, it yeah. Was, like the, yeah. It, it was made... Yes. So it's a rice dish, for those of you that don't know. And, <laughs> and it can be a little bit of everything in it. But usually there's, there's seafood. Yeah. And the one that you're talking about, a rose negro, it has black ink from a squid that's what it is and that's yeah. what gives it that color right and you know with a little areoli it's it's amazing yeah it, i just it, i didn't it didn't hit right with me but uh, yeah, i take well, right, i take your right. word from it so when if you squid? go to valencia paul's terrified yeah. right? squid ink <laughs> it's amazing if you go to valencia say what's the name of it again a rose negro no the the dish though the paella oh. and there's variations there's what oh, like there's all kinds of different yeah yeah, we can yeah. get them out here and they'll tell you in Spanish. But um, <laughs> it's an amazing dish. I mean, you have a little bit of everything in there. 
Yeah, you got to try it in Valencia. So you're, you're sitting next to someone that runs on Skyline and Burger King. So that's right. Yeah. Well, there you this go. This is out. This that's is outside right. of you his. Step outside uh, his your real. wheelhouse a little bit when you go to Europe. Squid ink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gives it the color. I can't tell if you're messing with me. No, no, I, he's I'm, not. It's a real serious. thing, Paul. Yep. All right, it's <laughs> right. a whole world out Embrace there. Embrace the culture. <laughs> I'm in. So, Justin, got to bring this up. This is you and I called shared suffering, and, and I often refer to this of, and I've had some heartbreaking games now. I mean, I've been in that Elite mm -hmm. Eight four times as, as a head coach and one other time as an assistant. So been in five Elite Eights. My record in those games was 0-5. Uh, three of those came down to the last play, right? So tough. The most difficult loss that I experienced would have been your last game at Xavier. We're in Rupp Arena. We had a terrific team especially on offense. It would have been your senior year. Mm -hmm. Drew Lavender had joined us. We could play at a pace, and a, it was a fun way to play. I mean, oh, I, yeah. I enjoyed coaching the team because we were so good on offense. But we're in Rupp Arena, and we're playing Ohio State. Coach Mata, ironically, so think about that, right? The guy that you played for in an Elite Eight and who, who was the head coach when you came here. Now we're playing Ohio State. They have Mike Conley Jr. and Greg Oden, Ron Lewis. Ron Lewis. Remember Ron Lewis? It, well, they lost to Florida in the national championship game that mm. year. Yep. So we played a great game. Your, your buddy in the same recruiting class, Justin Cage, God mm -hmm. love him. And I could be wrong on this. The, the number that I have in my mind is he was 11 for 11 from the floor. If he wasn't, he's very close. Eight he, for eight from the floor. He's having the game of his life. And uh, he had not missed a free throw or a shot. Fast forward, uh, coming down the home stretch, he's at a free throw. I think there's four seconds, maybe. I don't know, five. Yeah. It's right at the end. And uh, we're up three. And we had a timeout. The young coach in me said, you're not supposed to call a timeout because you're going to ice your shooter. I knew that he was having a great game. And he had an opportunity to basically put us up four. And at that point, game would have been over. Um, so I just, I just said, no, we're not going to call a timeout. But by not calling that timeout, we also could not talk to our players at all about, look, if we're up three, do we want to foul on purpose, which is the thing. We had thought about that. I think earlier in the year we might have done it, maybe not. I don't know if we had a steadfast rule. That was a long, long time ago as a coach. I don't think we had like a, a defined rule right. there situation. And by the way, you still have to make the shot. Sometimes it's going to be a tough shot. Well, it's like slow motion. You know, you watch him shoot it and you're like, oh, he missed it. And it's like outletted. It felt like two big dribbles across half court. And, you know, at that time, sometimes on defense, you're like scared to not want to foul. And just, he's not going to make that. And boom, it went in. And that didn't win the game. But what it did is a game we had basically led what felt like for most of the game and had it, it went to overtime. The other thing that happened in regulation is right before those free throws, is Greg Oden committed, in essence, his fifth foul. Now, I've seen Greg Oden many times since then, and I bring it up to him every time <laughs> I see him. And the reality of it is, he thought that was the last foul of his college career. He was frustrated, and he actually intentionally fouled on the play. Do you agree? Oh, I'd agree. Yeah. yeah. You can watch the replay. John Cow, God bless him, he's their Big East uh, head of officials, was on the call. If he didn't know that I still remembered, he does now. <laughs> he did not give him an intentional foul. That was his fifth foul. He had fouled out. If he gave him an intentional foul, we still win the game, right? Anyway, they make the shot. It was an amazing shot. They go on in overtime. We were a deflated group. They made plays in overtime and beat us. But from that point on, every game that I've ever coached, between 11 and 4 seconds, we, we foul. We call it smack. Okay. Now, there's weird scenarios that play out when you do it, especially if you do it with eight or nine seconds. The fan says, oh, smart move. But the coach in you says, now we have to inbound the ball. We have to make two more free throws. We, mm -hmm. It sometimes can create a scenario that's actually worse for you than being up three. Mm -hmm. Follow me on that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And depends on your, your personnel and how, how they are mentally at that time. But for the record, and I've kept track, Never one time since that game that we did it, did we lose. Fair enough. Not Sounds once. Like 
Yep. And I've done it every single time. Yep. We work on it in the in the preseason. And every time that we work on it, and every time that it happens in a game, I think about that, which for you was your last game of your college career. Mm -hmm. But I, I will tell you this. What that game did for our program is it gave everybody in our locker room and moving forward confidence that we not only can be a part of the of the tournament, but we're going to advance in the tournament. Mm -hmm. In the next year, if you remember, we yep. went all the way to the Elite Eight again and lost to UCLA. Yep. With a lot of your teammates that were in that game, and I think you guys really set the tone for what was to come. Yeah, I mean, like you said, we had we had a great great team just of, of that year and how deep we were. We were playing so many guys in the rotation, and a lot of those guys remained right. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, at that moment, that Ohio State, it still still hurts. Yeah, um, and I saw Thad Mata uh, when when he came to town, but yeah, just looking back on that is still painful. But I learned from that as well as yeah. you did, right over in Europe, like that. If you're up three, you foul no matter yep. no matter what. And more often than not, I've, I don't mm -hmm. think I've ever been a part of a game to where you've lost when you right. fouled. Right. You have to be smart with it and, and work on it, but yeah. no doubt. It, yeah, so. Absolutely. The gift that, that keeps giving, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Justin, well, you learned. Before, before we wrap it up, mm -hmm. please talk about your wonderful family that are, that are actually here. So yeah, Meredith, my wife, we've been married 17 years now. So she's uh, she was a standout soccer player yep. uh, here at Xavier. And then my daughter, Amaya, she was 11 years old. She's into soccer and basketball as well. And then my son, Braden, who's nine, is also into basketball and soccer. Braden, my youngest son is named Braden as well. Do you spell it B-R-A-D-E-N or a Y? Y. Y. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my Braden spells it B-R-A-D-E-N. You'll, uh, you'll get a kick out of this. When you guys were talking about Ohio State, I noticed your wife was, she was visibly upset in the background hearing about that story. Oh. <laughs> that was a tough loss. Oh, yeah. You know, the negative of it or the positive, however you want to look at it is we had to bus back because we were in Lexington, Kentucky. And, you know, sometimes when you think of the NCAA tournament, you're in a dome and you fly mm -hmm. and you go to this amazing location. You know, for us, it was you drove to Lexington, which is like an hour and a half. But yep. that was a tough bus ride, bus ride back. But when it ends and you know deep down you had a great season and you gave everything, everything, mm -hmm. you have a lot of pride in, in what just happened too. And yes. That's that's the other part of remembering that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. That bus ride, I mean, it was so quiet, you could hear a pin drop, but I think as much as it hurt, we still kept our chins high just from the season that we had had and we we knew that that call just just didn't go our yep. way i mean there's only so many things that you can control in yep. during during a game and it just the ball didn't bounce our way yeah so every practice plan for four years or three years in my case i had two jds you know i, I don't want to <laughs> write like he knows how i do it <laughs> yeah. you know justin dolman on blue or you know right. justin dolman on team one and josh duncan on team one and you know, i just go initials so i had these two jds so when I read him out to the team, you know, I'm, I go, J.D., you know, number one or team one or you're in blue and whatever. So because they're both J.D., <laughs> he was J.D. 15 and Josh Duncan was J.D. one. Yep. And again, every time I wrote that on, my, <laughs> on the practice sheet, it would always come back to like, can you believe this? Like they both wanted the same number, you yep. know. Uh, but yeah, Quick reminder. yeah, J.D. 15. It's great catching up with you. Uh Used to be quiet as a mouse. I used to wonder how you convinced Meredith to 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 fall in love and, and become your wife. But man, you had you have a world of personality right now. You might be a broadcasting candidate. I mean, he's uh, very know, well spoken, that, sharp. Yeah. Look at him, relaxed. Do you, do you recall a quick story about Meredith? The the first person I asked if if I could get married. Do you know who that was? Who you? You were the first person because going into my senior say, year, run, you, I was like, you hey, better, you better hurry up and get that done. It's probably yeah. right. <laughs> you, you, you're like, go, go for it. And, and she's still here. So she Actually, still keeps me around. What I was probably thinking is definitely do it. Are you sure she's going to say yes? Yeah, true. <laughs> fair, fair enough. And luckily she did. She did. Awesome. You guys have a wonderful family. Great catching up. Thanks for being a season ticket holder. And uh, Pleasure. You know, when I think back to the glory days of my first time here, those eight years, and that's how long I was here the first time, I, you know, you're in so many different, different memories and learning experiences, and we had a great run together. 
Yeah, I mean, before the news even broke that you were coming, uh, guys were calling me, hey, did you talk Sean or anything like that? I was like, no, I have no clue, but I'm getting season tickets just in case. <laughs> and then, yeah, it's been amazing to bring the kids and just come back into the arena and obviously watch you. There's a lot of nostalgia there. So Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Happy Thank to you. do it. Thanks for having me on the show, guys. Appreciate you being Thanks here. Thanks for doing it. Justin, yep, it's great anytime. to see you. Uh, as always, make sure you subscribe to the show. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. Uh, it, you can follow us on all social media platforms, Twitter, fa- or I guess X. I, one day I'll get it right. Uh, <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all those places at Sean Miller Pod. Thanks to our presenting sponsor at Deer Park Roofing, the official payroll sponsor of the Sean Miller Podcast, payroll partners, and then our friends at TG Solar as well. This has been the Sean Miller Podcast. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. This has been the Sean Miller Podcast, presented by Deer Park Roofing, with your hosts, Paul Fritchner and Adam Bow. Join us again soon for another episode with the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Sean Miller. Stop renting your power. Own it. TGE Solar makes it easy to purchase solar panels for your home or business so you can take control of your monthly electricity bill and start saving today. They'll help you find the best solar system to meet your needs, and their expert in-house installation team makes the process seamless. They're proud to be based in Cincinnati, family-owned and operated by a Xavier alum. Mention this podcast and save $1,000. Visit TGESolar.com to request your free energy evaluation today. The Sean Miller Podcast is proud to partner with Deer Park Roofing, a company that's provided elite service for homes and businesses since 1996 and leads the industry in professionalism, quality, and responsiveness. Whether your needs are residential or commercial, like the outstanding work on the Cintas Center, the home of Xavier Basketball, Deer Park can handle any job and ensure it's done right. Deer Park's motto is protect what's important, and what's important to you is important to Deer Park Roofing. Visit DeerParkRoofing.com.